welcome everyone. This week we have Dr. Andrea, sorry, Adrian Correa from uh, Rice University in Texas. Uh, Adrian studies microbial uh, interactions uh, within marine invertebrates, specifically for corals. She's uh, today she's going to be specifically talking about the dinoflagellate symbioses in corals, but uh, she's also previously published a lot of really interesting work on microbial uh, uh, community dynamics as well as some viral, intera viral interactions on corals as well. Uh, prior to uh, studying her assistant professorship at Rice, uh, Dr. Correa did a postdoc at the University of the, uh, sorry, Oregon State University, where she worked with uh, Dr. Becky uh, Vega Thurber. And uh, prior to that, she got her PhD from Columbia University. So with that, um, I'll leave it off to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kenny, for that nice introduction. And thanks to both you and Brandy um, for inviting me to give this seminar. And thanks to everyone who came. Um, I'm going to shut this little window now so I no longer can see any of you, but I can see my slides. Um, so sorry about that. If anyone has a question or if you're writing something in chat, uh, somebody feel free to just uh, break in because otherwise I will not know until uh, this comes off of presentation view. Um, but anyway, I'm excited to be here with you all and have an opportunity to talk with you about some work that's been ongoing in my lab recently, um, looking at how, how fishes uh, act as consumers and may influence corals and coral reefs in ways that we haven't necessarily thought of previously. Um, whoop. There we go. And the first thing I'd like to do is give a giant shout out to Karsten Krupstra, who is a PhD candidate in my lab, um, who has done an amazing job leading um, all of this work. So coral reefs are these productive, biodiverse ecosystems that span hundreds of kilometers like the Great Barrier Reef, um, and that you can see from space. But when you zoom in to a reef, um, you can see that it's primarily composed of these stony coral colonies, um, like on this bummy. And so each one of these coral colonies, if you zoom in even further, you can see a coral polyp. Hopefully you can see my mouse, which is circling one of these coral polyps right now. Um, and that's the clonal or like the fundamental unit of a coral colony. And um, to build these giant uh, reef frameworks, coral animals are helped by this mutual, uh, typically mutualistic partnership that they have with dinoflagellates that live in their tissues, in their gastroderm. And these particular dinoflagellates are in the family Symbiodineaceae. So I'm going to say that a lot, uh, Symbiodineaceae. And <coughs> sorry, this is a nutritional symbiosis. So these dinoflagellates are photosynthesizing, and they can leak up to 95% of the sugars that they make out into the coral tissue, and the coral uses that to um, energetically subsidize these massive calcium carbonate reef frameworks that they build. And in return, because coral reefs typically or naturally exist in nutrient poor or oligotrophic environments, uh, the Symbiodineaceae are receiving nutrients that they need uh, in the form of coral waste products, and they also are receiving a sort of stable or sheltered place um, on the ocean floor where it's very competitive, uh, a very competitive place for space uh, where they can grow and pro proliferate. And so um, within Symbiodineaceae, there are now seven uh, genera and three unnamed clades, which you can see uh, summarized in this phylogenetic tree. And these Symbiodineaceae, I should say, they don't just uh, form symbioses with stony corals. They also live in lots of other marine invertebrates, ranging from giant clams to soft corals to foraminifera. Um, and so in terms of stony corals, there are four of these genera that are most commonly associated with stony corals. And I'm going to quickly point those out. They are Symbiodinium, Durastinium, Breviolum, and Cladocopium. Um, and so this huge genetic diversity that exists within Symbiodineaceae um, and within these genera uh, 
can influence the physiology expressed by a coral colony. So the coral colony is a holobiont, which means it's the host coral tissue, plus all of this microbial symbionts that are residing in and on its tissues. So I'll be talking about um, some of this genetic diversity within Symbiodiniaceae today, uh, and also within other microbial symbionts. And sometimes I'm gonna use differently colored dots to represent uh, a Symbiodiniaceae of a particular species or a type that could have, for example, um, that could contribute to a different physiology in a coral colony. Uh, so here are those dinoflagellates, Symbiodiniaceae, um, and stony corals have been called the world's most diverse symbiotic ecosystem because they not only harbor this immense diversity of dinoflagellates, but they also harbor fungi, bacteria, and archaea living on and in their tissues, and even in their calcium carbonate framework just below this surface of living tissue on a coral. And so we have, as a field, we've looked a lot into how this relationship between the dinoflagellates and the coral works, and um, a significant amount into how bacteria interact with uh, coral hosts. But interestingly, and I think this is a very cool place that the field is starting to go, um, you know, there also can be the potential for interactions between these different microbial partners uh, and not just with the host coral alone. So I think that is a fascinating direction in symbiosis ecology. And then also there are viruses that infect, that can potentially infect not just the coral tissue itself, but also any one of these uh, microbial symbiont partners. So there can be eukaryotic viruses infecting some, and then phage or bacteriophage that are targeting bacteria or archaea. Um, and so I'm very interested uh, in thinking about all of these different potential interactions that are happening and how that might influence coral colony physiology um, to think about the roles of viruses, which really have not been explored too much. So unfortunately, I don't have time today to talk about another major, <coughs> sorry, another major line of inquiry in my lab, which is specifically looking at a group of eukaryotic viruses that uh, we have mounting evidence infects Symbiodiniaceae. Uh, and these are, because they're dinoflagellate infecting RNA viruses, we call them dino RNA Vs. So hopefully we'll have some new publications coming out on that soon as well. Um, but anyway, with, you know, whether you're thinking about all of these symbionts living inside of a coral colony or fungal symbionts living inside a grass host or bacteria living in our own digestive tracts or in other parts of our bodies, um, you know, microbial symbionts live essentially in all animals and plants and they impact holobiont phenotypes and physiologies, uh, and they can contribute importantly to ecosystem processes. So, you know, I know at DISL, I don't have to convince you about the importance of studying ocean organisms and ocean processes, but in addition to learning about thing, you know, the way that the ocean works um, by studying this system, uh, it also has broad implications for understanding hosts and symbionts sort of writ large, uh, hosts and microbial symbionts. Um, but for stony corals that are obligate, they, they have to have Symbiodiniaceae in their tissues to survive long-term. Um, that's typically a beneficial relationship, but there also can be some risks inherent to being so reliant on a microbial partner. Um, and so, you know, You've probably heard in the news or studied in your program uh, that there are unfortunately a number of threats to coral reef ecosystems that have been occurring over the last decades and acting together. Um, sorry, I don't know if you can hear that, but we're having an outdoor emergency test at Rice right now. It'll be over in a couple minutes. Uh, so anyway, um, these different threats uh, can act alone or in combination to disrupt host microbial symbiont processes. Um, and so one of the best known ways that corals, um, coral reefs are being threatened is through a uh, coral microbe partnership breaking down when uh, seas are warmed due to climate change. So here is a healthy reef um, 
that was photographed in December of 2014. And this is a cross section through a coral colony. And you can see here, you can see this calcium carbonate framework inside this thin living veneer of coral tissue and the Symbiodineaceae are in there. So when there is a stressful event, an anomalous event on a reef, um, you can have bleaching and bleaching is when uh, there's a mass loss of Symbiodineaceae from the coral colony and you can see that uh, with them leaving here and because Symbiodineaceae have a yellow brown pigmentation, when they leave uh, living coral tissue and mass, then you can see through that living coral tissue, you can see the white calcium carbonate framework and the coral colony looks bleached. So the coral's still alive right here, but it's in a diminished health state. And so now a couple different things can happen. Either uh, conditions can improve and the Symbiodineaceae community will be recovered in hopefully about four to six weeks. And you can have at least um, some of that coral tissue survive and recover. Or um, unfortunately, if that can't happen, you can have mortality of that coral colony. And so here you can see during, um, these, these photographs were taken during the third global coral bleaching event, which went from 2014 to 2017, uh, not in any one place for three years, but at different reefs around the world for a three years continuous period. And unfortunately on many reefs, um, this is what happened. Uh, Symbiodineaceae communities did not recover and corals died or were outcompeted by macroalgae or sponges. So here they've got this brown pigmentation uh, back on the coral colony, but it's not because the coral is alive and it has Symbiodineaceae. Instead, it has it now has uh, turf algaes or cyanobacteria growing over top of the calcium carbonate skeleton. So on a reef like this, we say there's been a shift from coral dominance to macroalgal dominance. And I'm gonna come back to that, um, you know, coral versus macroalgal dominance in a bit. Uh, but one thing that you should know is that once a reef has become dominated by macroalgae, it can be very difficult for it to revert back to a live coral dominated state. Uh, which is very concerning since this is happening in so many reefs around the world. In fact, um, it has been estimated that 70% of coral reefs will be degraded by 2030. Now I'm getting the emergency call inside my office, sorry. Um, so understanding, uh, my, my lab uses, integrates across diverse techniques to try to understand which microbes are present, how they interact with each other, and how those interactions influence marine holobionts and also ecosystem processes, both in a um, natural or uh, less disturbed reef state, and also under these global change stressors um, that are affecting reefs across around the world. So <clears throat> uh, one of the things I would like to talk with you about now is, okay, We've gone over how coral animals host all of these different microbes. Where are they getting those microbes that form their microbiome? Um, and so, for example, for Symbiodineaceae and its hosts, uh, one of the ways that we describe this is via vertical transmission. So here you can see a parent colony and it has a bunch of dots which are representing symbionts inside of it. And when this parent colony reproduces, it uh, makes a planula or a larva or an egg that already has uh, Symbiodineaceae inside of it. So it's it's these symbionts are being vertically transmitted to the young, to the off to the next generation, and can support um, can help found the Symbiodineaceae colony in the next generation. So that's vertical transmission. Another option is horizontal tra transmission in which the parent colony still has Symbiodineaceae, but when it produces its offspring, uh, none of those Symbiodineaceae are packaged into the next generation. And so this planula or larvae or egg uh, needs to acquire its Symbiodineaceae from the external environment. And by the time it is, uh, an adult colony or a juvenile colony growing on the reef bottom, if you see it, you would see it in this colored state where it has those Symbiodineaceae already. So a coral that's successfully growing to a size where you're going to notice it swimming on the reef 
it, if it's a horizontal transmitter, it has successfully picked up these Symbiogeneaceae and uh, established a community. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so about 50% of corals are horizontal transmitters. And so, you know, I just want to emphasize that that 50% of these diverse coral species have to rely on environmental pools um, from which each generation can, can found or assemble its microbiome. Uh, and so we've, we've looked a lot at whether corals are vertical or horizontal transmitters and thought about how that might influence um, the, the symbioses that we detect or characterize on the reef and how this might uh, help them perform or respond to their environment. But we have not spent a lot of time as a field thinking about what fills these environmental pools up with Symbiodineaceae. Um, actually, even starting in the, the late 2000s was when we started really even being able to characterize where Symbiodineaceae were in the environment. Um, but we, you know, even with doing that, we haven't talked about like the processes that would that would fill up these different pools. And so this is not just interesting for corals. Um, it's also interesting if you think about microbiome assembly in basically any sessile foundation species. So sessile meaning it, it does not move around, it settles or starts growing somewhere and pretty much stays there for its life. Uh, and foundation species meaning um, something that is habitat forming or uh, forming a significant, um, a significant structure in the environment that other organisms might use, for example. So corals on a reef, also sponges on a reef, uh, perhaps oyster beds or trees if you're thinking about uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi or marsh grasses, etc. All of these things have microbial symbionts. They're very important uh, ecosystem engineers. And um, it's interesting to think about if they're horizontally transmitting, where do they get those microbiomes? <clears throat> so in terms of back to Symbiodineaceae and the environment, digging down into these different environmental pools a bit more, um, you know, here's a coral with its different types of Symbiodineaceae that are all sort of within one genre of color. And here's another, here's some macroalgae. Um, so we've seen in terms of environmental pools, we've detected Symbiodineaceae in the water column, we've detected it on the surfaces of macroalgae, and we've detected it in the sediments. Um, and this is where I want to further acknowledge Karsten or Cass, and also Kristen Rabbit and Lauren Hauker, who um, have also worked on uh, this project. One of the things that got us thinking about um, fish consumers and how they might influence the dispersal of, uh, of microbial symbionts is that when we looked at these environmental pools, dis despite being able to detect Symbiodineaceae in them, uh, the densities of Symbiodineaceae were quite low considering uh, the number of hosts in the environment. And uh, many of the Symbiodineaceae variants detected from these different pools were, were very genetically different from what you typically find dominating corals. So we felt like something might still be missing that was important from our understanding. And that's where these coral eating or corallivorous fishes come in um, because these fishes prey on corals typically without killing the entire colony. So they're biting as you can see here. Um, and then interestingly what you're watching with this parrotfish is that they, they will bite and then swim up in the water column and after digesting what they've eaten, um, if a lot of it's been coral, you'll see essentially sand, um, which is ground up coral framework, uh, be defecated out onto the reef. Okay, so there are two papers that are terrific papers that really inspired us to want to pursue this line of question. One of them was by Giselle Mueller Parker Zoxanthellae, dispersal of zoxanthellae, that's another word for Symbiodineaceae on coral reefs by predators of cnidarians. And another paper um, by Carolina Castro Sanguino and Juan Sanchez, uh, looking specifically at uh, the stoplight parrotfish, Sparizoma viridi, in the Caribbean. So in these papers, um, they found that 
looking at um, the feces of these fish, they were able to detect that some Symbiodineaceae in feces were photosynthetically viable or culturable. So that showed that at least some cells would pass through the digestive tract um, of predators and, and, and be able to continue growing or photo photosynthesize. However, one thing that uh, we were really interested in drilling down into further is whether or not, you know, that's most cells or um, just a few cells in a, in, a, in a piece of fecal material. Because corals have about 1.5 to 2 million Symbiodineaceae cells in a square centimeter of coral tissue. So if an organism is eating lots of coral tissue, um, perhaps, and then it passes through a consumer gut, Perhaps most of it comes out dead, but the occasional cell survives um, versus another scenario where lots of the cells come out viable. And then uh, the Castro Sanguino and Sanchez paper used genetic approaches uh, and cloning, and they were able to detect three Symbiodineaceae uh, genera uh, from the feces of the stoplight parafish. Um, but because of the techniques that they were able to apply at the time and the amount of um, samples they could work with, uh, they're, they're, uh, and they found that there was Symbiodinium breviolum and clade G. <clears throat> so two of those, Symbiodinium and breviolum, interestingly, are commonly observed in stony corals. Um, <coughs> however, uh, we wanted to know whether or not um, what what these two papers had found was likely to be broadly generalizable to this huge diversity of coralivorous fishes around the world, you know, which includes 11 fish families. So our hypothesis going into this project was that coralivorous fishes drive the dispersal and assembly of Symbiodineaceae and perhaps other coral microbes on reefs. And we thought in particular that this, there might be some sort of silver lining to being eaten for corals uh, in this case if that improved their access to beneficial uh, microbial symbionts. And so the work I'm going to show you was done in Morea French Polynesia, which is in the South Pacific, very, very far from North America. Uh, here's Morea, and we had, for, the, for what I'm going to show you, we had two back reef sites and two fore reef sites. Whoop. And um, it's really nice working, uh, doing this work in Morea because it is a, it is the only coral reef long-term ecological research site run through the National Science Foundation, which means that since 2004, every year the LTER is going out and collecting all sorts of ecological data on these reefs. So we know, <clears throat> we have access to information about the relative abundance and um, species diversity of fishes, corals, macroalgae, all sorts of things um, going back in time. And another interesting thing that happened while we were doing this work was that a bleaching event occurred uh, in Morea. This is the fore reef in Morea in April 2019. And you can see that um, there was heterogeneous or patchy bleaching in that at least at the time of this photo, some colonies had bleached entirely, others were sort of at an intermediate stage of bleaching, and then some had not yet appeared to show any bleaching signs at all. So um, we were interested in, you know, what coralivorous fish would do in this situation. And, you know, it was even tantalizing to think uh, that perhaps if they were eating some of these unbleached colonies, um, if they might be able to help uh, disperse healthy symbionts that uh, these bleached colonies could use to recover. Um, I'm not going to answer that question in this talk. We are not there yet, uh, but this is something that uh, made us feel very interested in what coralivores might be doing. Uh, so what we, what we did uh, for our methods for Symbiodineaceae was for, uh, we collected fish of many different species and we um, collected samples that allowed us to look at Symbiodineaceae cell density and viability using hemocytometry and Tripan Blue, which is a cell viability stain. We attempted to culture Symbiodineaceae um, from some of those samples. And then we also looked at uh, genus level 
uh, Symbiodiniaceae community composition using the inter internal transcribed spacer 2 region of ribosomal DNA. So we did this for different uh, trophic guilds of fish. Uh, so for some fishes, for four species, we looked at obligate coralivore feces. So these fish ate only coral, and you can see sample sizes here for each of those. Uh, we had three species of facultative coralivores, which means that they would sometimes eat coral, but they also would eat sponges or macroalgae or um, bite at other things on the reef floor. So we were able to sample them. And then we also sampled uh, individuals of two grazer detritivore species, um, which did not eat coral at all. So they functioned as a control, essentially. Uh, and they typically eat macroalgae and detritus. And we did feeding surveys also, uh, fish follows to confirm what the fish were actually eating at the time that we sampled. And then we also took uh, samples from environmental pools, known environmental pools, sediments, and water. And we also sampled uh, three dominant coral species in those environments. Um, and so, you know, those cells we primarily expected to be alive. Uh, so we just looked at the genetic diversity of Symbiodiniaceae in those. <clears throat> and so very quickly, um, I also want to talk about, go back to what maintains coral dominance on reefs, um, because in a uh, more pristine state, a, a reef will typically be dominated by corals. Macroalgae will be present, but it won't be, um, it won't be a, a visually dominant feature of the landscape like it is here in this image. Um, this is also in Morea, and these, uh, these, these rods or uh, long spires are not coral, they are turbinaria uh, macroalgae. <clears throat> So, and you can see some coral reef framework with coral that's mostly dead, uh, and these macroalgae have colonized and grown on top. Um, so, the paradigm for what maintains this coral dominated state and limits macroalgae on a reef is that grazing fish keep coral, allow, help corals continue to be dominant by eating macroalgal competitors. So, those macroalgae will start growing, but grazers are so effective at eating them up that they essentially eat them before they grow into those, those large uh, bushy masses. So you can see just classic examples of this type of thing. Um, there have been a lot of, of factorial experiments excluding grazing fish from patches of reef using cages, which you can see part of here, um, to understand you know, how the extent to which grazers limit macroalgal growth. Um, so in this study by Zanneveld et al, they used caging to keep fish out of plots of reef, and then they also um, put out nutrients on some of those plots to see how that would affect macroalgal growth. But on this open plot where there's just fencing on the sides, on three of the sides, but not on the top, grazing fish could come in and um, based on the paradigm, they ate up that macroalgae. And here you can see inside one of these fish exclosures. So if you keep grazing fishes from accessing part of the reef bottom, you can see that all of this macroalgae starts growing up. And the typical paradigm for the role of coralliverous fish on reefs is that they, um, that they bite reef frameworks uh, in order to um, consume organisms living or hiding in uh, in the coral reef framework. And when they digest that calcium carbonate, they break it down into small pieces or grind it into small pieces, making sand. And also their um, bioerosive activities will make cracks and crevices in which other, other organisms can live. So the paradigm for coralivorous, coralivorous fishes is that they are removing calcium carbonate from the net carbonate budget or from the carbonate budget of reefs um, but not, ne not necessarily contributing to coral dominance. <clears throat> okay, so here are our results um, from this first set of, of analyses that we did. Um, so here is a little visual um, depiction of 
the density of Symbiodeniaceae in water, macroalgae, and sediments. Um, and here you can see um, in our samples of sediment and water, uh, this is um, Symbiodeniaceae cells per milliliter. And then on the x-axis of this graph, I've got species here of these different categories, and then their trophic guild. <clears throat> and then here's environmental samples. So, and then these dots, uh, this is an average or a mean large dot. Um, the blue are dead Symbiodeniaceae cells based on this viability stain, and the black are live Symbiodeniaceae cells. So for sediment and water, we our results matched um, previous publications on environmental pools. But when we looked at uh, feces from these different types of fishes, what we found was that coral eating fish feces contained high densities of live Symbiodeniaceae cells, um, which are these black dots. And in particular, um, that these coralivorous fishes, many of them, or a variety of them, had significantly higher densities of live cells than did um, some facultative coralivores and the grazer detritivores. And here is an example of some of our culturing results where you can see that, um, for example, from feces of Ketodon or Natissimus, uh, these are Symbiodeniaceae cells. Some of them are in the mastigote stage uh, where they have two flagella and can spin all around. Um, so we saw lots of examples like this as well, where cells appeared to be intact and viable. All right, and then in terms of the genetic diversity, of Symbiodeniaceae in fish feces. Um, this graph is a, a heat map of the relative gene abundance of uh, these different Symbiodeniaceae genera based on the ITS2. And so colors closer to blue um, indicate a high relative gene abundance, colors closer to white indicate um, absence or very minimal detection of, uh, of a particular genus. So, and then here again are the, uh, the species or genera and these different categories. Um, and so an important thing that I want to point out to you here is that um, these obligate coralivores were statistically indistinguishable from the Symbiodeniaceae communities in Pasilopera and Parides corals on the reef um, that they commonly ate and bit. So, Essentially, um, the Symbiodeniaceae communities in these fishes that are that are only eating coral in their diet are very similar to some of the corals on the reef. Um, whereas grazer detritivores, for example, uh, are are quite quite different. <clears throat> um, and then we basically took the data that we had collected um, from these different feces and uh, measurements of their uh, fecal pellet size, density, et cetera, and we combined that with data from the NSF LTER site about um, density of fish species on the reef, and we were able to, um, to expand out our, our uh, calculations to estimate the number of dispersed cells, dispersed Symbiodeniaceae cells per 100 meters squared per day uh, for a given fish species. And what we found for the three species that we've done so far, uh, Ketodon reticulatus and Ketodon ornatissimus, and this other facultative coralivore, uh, Ketodon citronellus, is that um, the obligate coralivores dispersed the most live Symbiodeniaceae cells per day, and pretty amazingly it was over 100 million live cells per 100 meter square <clears throat> per day. Um, and then we were also interested in whether or not um, these fish feces were potentially coming in direct contact with corals. And so on the fore reef, during our fish follows, we also kept track of where feces, uh, what the fate of feces was when we saw a, a defecation. And so in 91% of the defecations that we observed, at least some segment of uh, fecal material fell and came in contact with a stony coral. Um, this percentage is lower on the back reef where uh, coral cover is lower. Um, 
and we're continuing we are we're continuing uh to sort of look into this it is a very time consuming uh method of data collection it's easy to follow fish it's not as often that you follow a fish and observe it defecating um but we also think that even if feces don't fall on corals, they could potentially contribute to other environmental pools like sediments if they disintegrate at some point in the environment. So as a quick um, take home of this part of my talk, we found that obligate coralivore feces contain very high densities of live coral associated microbes, particularly Symbiodiniaceae, and that um, the Symbiodiniaceae in obligate coralivore feces are very similar to certain types of corals where they live. And that when you expand out um, these numbers, obligate coralivores disperse a lot of Symbiodiniaceae across reefs per day. And so uh, based on this, we, we feel that coralivores fish feces are an important environmental hotspot uh, for live Symbiodiniaceae that has not been uh, fully, fully realized yet in a coral environment. We also wanted to look at coral associated bacteria and bacterial communities in fish feces. Um, they are more, it's more complicated to look at bacterial communities because, uh, because Symbiodiniaceae, if you make a Symbiodiniaceae detection in fish feces, then you know it was uh, not from the fish. But with bacteria, uh, fish fish harbor their own bacterial microbiomes, and so um, and so it's it's a bit more complicated to tackle what is the core microbiome uh, in terms of bacteria of the fish versus what are auxiliary bacteria that uh, might be environmental or from its food uh, in feces, <clears throat> but. And this is where the hot off the press starts. Uh, so these graphs that I'm going to show you are relative abundances of different um, families of bacteria that you can see here. And I know um, that this legend is pretty small, but here it is for coral. And one thing that I want to immediately point out to you. Uh, so each one of these vertical bars is a single uh, sample from an individual. And so one thing that hopefully is jumping out at you is this teal green color, and that is Endozoicomonadaceae, which is a recognized coral-associated uh, bacterial symbiont. It also is found in oysters, um, but by and large, Endozoicomonas is, is definitely uh, associated with corals. It's not associated with fish, and we're <laughs> not surprisingly, we're seeing it here in uh, a lot of the coral species. We also see it in feces of the obligate coralivore and uh, various facultative coralivores. Uh, we'll come back to this CHISP, which is Chlorus spillerus, uh, in a bit. <clears throat> and in terms of the water and sediment samples, um, we're not seeing that endozoicomonas, nor are we seeing it in the grazer detritivore. Interestingly, uh, in the grazer detritivore, one thing that jumps out immediately is this Vibrionaceae family. Vibrios, um, they can be coral associated pathogens, particularly during high temperatures. Uh, and they, Vibrios are known to be harbored on the surfaces of macroalgae that compete with corals. So it wasn't very surprising um, from that standpoint, from the standpoint that we know that they are often found on macroalgae, to see that they're in the feces of grazer detritivores, which, are eat, which may eat mac or eat macroalgae as a significant component of their environment. So it's very interesting to see that these potential coral pathogens are a common component of the grazer detritivore feces. Um, and of course, I want to bring it back to Chlorus spillerus, uh, who is here in this facultative coralivore uh, section. So Chlorus spillerus um, had a lot of this vibrio in its feces also. There is a lot to unpack and further investigate here because uh, as a parrotfish, parrotfish eat uh, coral at different amounts throughout their life and size stages. And since they also eat macroalgae, um, if, if these chlorospillaris are eating a lot of macroalgae on the reef, then they very well 
uh, could have vibrios. So this is a, a first look into these bacterial communities and how interestingly um, obligate coralivores and facultative coralivore feces have some bacterial elements that are similar to healthy corals, whereas um, there are potentially coral associated pathogens or things that could be pathogenic for corals in grazers and this parrotfish. Um, and just really quickly to show you an NMDS, uh, for these types of graphs, points that are closer together in space are more similar to each other. So each one of these uh, little words or symbols represents the bacterial community um, from a single sample of something. And so points closer together in space are more similar to each other. Points further apart in space are more different from each other. So you can see um, that these different, both on the level of a trophic guild, counting each one of these as a guild, and then also um, at the level of species, uh, each of these groups is significant, significantly different. And I just want to call your attention, you know, interestingly, this facultative uh, coralivore species polygon is large and includes the grazer detritivore, but uh, this is that Chlorus spillerus again that had the Vibrio uh, up in, in the previous slide uh, that is more similar to the grazer detritivore. All right, and uh, hopefully I will not um, run up too close on time. But another thing we immediately wanted to do after seeing these differences in, uh, in microbial composition in these different types of fish feces is start doing some experiments in which we experimentally uh, manipulated individual coral colonies um, by breaking them into fragments allowing them to recover from that fragmenting experience and then taking a, um, applying five different treatments to a fragment from each individual colony to test whether or not different types of fish feces had different influences on the health of a coral colony. So in our first experiment, we use this Postal Opera um, coral, which is a very common dominant reef builder. Uh, in a 22-hour experiment, we did these fragments and we harvested feces from uh, an obligate coralivore and a grazer. And then we took those feces uh, for the coralivore and mixed them all together and then made different treatments out of them. And then we did the same thing with the grazers. So um, for the coralivore feces, we kept some of it uh, untouched. And then another part of that uh, mass of feces, we sterilized in an autoclave, and then we did the same for the grazer. Um, and then the fifth treatment was um, no fecal addition at all. So here you can see different fragments um, with heating to a normal coral temperature and bubblers in these containers. And this is what uh, fecal material looks like added to a coral fragment. So we took a variety of measurements um, before we started the experiment. And then um, at 22 hours, we carefully removed the feces from any treatment. Um, and then we took uh, post measurements. Oh, and by the way, the sterile treatments were performed to try to separate out the impact of just having physical material placed on a coral colony versus um, the live microbial composition within feces. <clears throat> So we looked for signs of health or disease on the coral fragment. We took measurements of photosynthetic efficiency um, from each coral fragment. And we also took samples of coral tissue, which would contain Symbiodiniaceae and bacteria. And we also filtered the water from each container um, so that we could also look at what was in the water <coughs> um, before and after the experiment. And so now I'm gonna quickly show you, um, here is, the same spot is gonna be in a rectangle of uh, one replicate before or at the beginning of the experiment when the feces were placed on the fragment and we placed the same, uh, pipetted the same amount of feces in each, onto each fragment. And then once we had carefully removed um, the feces, we took another picture. So with this live or fresh coralivore feces, after the treatment was removed, we didn't see any visual signs of distress or lesions in the coral colony. Um, but with the fresh or live grazer feces, here's the fecal material, we saw lesions <coughs> um, on the coral fragment afterwards. And so here's 
just another example of a fresh corallivore versus a, a fresh grazer fecal material. And in, in uh, some of these, we saw the water getting murky um, as well by the end of the treatment, possibly indicating a bacterial bloom. So summarizing across uh, our visual uh, health estimates of all of these different fragments, orange indicates no lesion present or detected at the end of the experiment, and gray indicates that that fragment had a lesion. So uh, the main thing here is that every single fresh or live uh, grazer treatment, every, uh, every single fragment had uh, a lesion. Interestingly, half of the um, coral fragments in the sterile treatment, including in the corallivore uh, fecal treatment, had lesions and the other half did not. Um, this is a place where we want to drill down uh, further. It may be that autoclaving the fecal material changed a physical quality of that material, um, maybe making uh, it less, I don't know, maybe it adhered more closely to the coral surface or something like that. So uh, we need to try to understand what happened here better. Um, but this is very interesting. And I'll quickly show you um, some of the results that we got for photosynthetic efficiency or FV over FM of photosymbionts in the coral. Um, so, so we used an imaging pulse amplitude modu modulation fluorometer or imaging PAM. And the cool thing with an imaging PAM is it doesn't take just, uh, just one point reading on your fragment. It, it, cal it um, takes measurements across the entire surface of something. So we dark adapted these for 20 minutes and then took readings um, both before applying a treatment and then at the end of the experiment after we'd carefully removed um, the feces. And then these, um, I apologize, but these, these photos are actually missing one of the circles. But essentially you can see um, based on a color scale that high levels of photosynthetic um, efficiency are more towards the purples and low levels are more towards the red. <clears throat> um, so what we did was we had, uh, we took one measurement right where the fecal material was, one that was uh, a bit of the way, uh, right basically at the edge of where the fecal material was, and then one that was uh, another reading um, or another value that was as far from the fecal material as we could on the fragment. <clears throat> and so in this graph, uh, zero is where the feces was placed during the experiment. One is at, at sort of the uh, right next to where the feces had been, and two was far from where the feces had been. So um, the important take home message here is that, so these gray bars are all at T equals zero hours. They all had similar photosynthetic efficiencies. Um, the coral and the fresh corallivore feces had no change, no significant change at 22 hours, um, but the fresh grazer feces had significantly lower um, lower FV over FM readings, both um, both where the feces were, which of course in this treatment was because there was no longer any tissue, but also on living tissue that was adjacent to where the fecal treatment had been. Um, there, were, there were decreases in photosynthetic efficiency. And as a, um, a very quick teaser, we now have uh, limited data from 2018. We have data from 2019, a lot of which I've shown you today. And we also, in October of 2020, were able to go and collect more field samples. So in the future, um, we are gonna be digging down into how uh, the microbial communities inside of feces changes during a bleaching event, et cetera. So for example, for Symbiodiniaceae, we've already seen for these four species that there is lower species richness in feces um, during a bleaching event as opposed to before a bleaching event. Um, so we're very interested to see how this might match up with uh, different fish feeding preferences and uh, species and microbial community compositions. So to wrap up, in terms of the big picture, uh, most studies have looked at the role of grazers in maintaining a coral-dominated reef state, but corallivores can potentially contribute to reef resilience by promoting the acquisition of beneficial symbionts by corals. 
And one of the places we particularly want to look into this is in juvenile corals of horizontally transmitting species because juveniles in particular um, seem more prone to pick up lots of different types of Symbiodiniaceae in the environment. So they might be a group that's particularly, uh, might particularly benefit from this. So that's the thank you for biting. And this has broad implications for understanding dispersal and assembly of microbiomes in lots of different foundation species. And, um, you know, it's, it, we have a lot of work to do to test whether or not bleaching corals might be able to pick up uh, Symbiodiniaceae or bacteria from fecal material. Um, but this has interesting management in, uh, implications and could contribute to uh, restoration and con conservation efforts. Uh, and we have a lot of manipulative experiments on deck. Uh, so with that, I wanna acknowledge Karsten again, um, thank everyone in my lab and my great collaborators in Morea and all of you. And I'm happy to take any questions. Really interesting when you added the feces in, in your experiments, uh, how the grazers seem to create lesions and, and the coralivores did not. Do you think there might be one of the sort of aspects that are, are going on there is sort of nutrients from the feces that can be sort of being sucked up by the symbionts within the coral. And that might be playing a role more so than, than symbiodinaceae in the feces um, benefiting the coral. Um, well, I definitely think that in one of the challenges, uh, that's a great question. I think one of the challenges of doing these experiments is going to be parsing out, uh, yeah, potential uh, roles of nutrients versus, um, you know, a physical material being on a colony surface versus uh, what, what Symbiodiniaceae or bacteria or any other microorganism might be doing. And I think um, this does, you know, this experiment was with, was, a, was small scale. And so I would like to go and repeat it and, and try to um, do some tests with, you know, things like, I think, I think it would be very interesting to look at the, um, the composition of the grazer versus the coralivore feces in terms of protein content and carbon content and all that. And in fact, that's like an entire other, uh, as I was writing a, a, a proposal this summer, I was trying to figure out which of these aspects I wanted to test. And through discuss discussions with folks, I realized they are probably like two whole separate lines of inquiry are, you know, what, what do the microorganisms do, if anything? And then also, you know, people don't think about coprophagy or consumption of feces, I think, too much um, by corals, or at least I can't find a lot of literature on it. Um, but perhaps it is a, an important source of heterotrophic feeding for them. And, and that could vary by, by uh, fecal origin, or like which, feces, which fish the feces are coming from. Absolutely. It'd also be interesting if, um, you know, for example, if, if you're looking at metabolites within the, and within the feces themselves, for the grazers, I wonder if there's sort of noxious chemicals from some of the macroalgae that they're eating, which is partially at least causing those lesions. So, you know, you're putting all those metabolites right there, uh, and perhaps that's what's causing more, more lesions. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks. All right. Well, I think that's it for uh, for today. Thanks again for uh, for joining and sharing uh, your work. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was it was great to get to be here. <laughs>